I think culture is one of those things that people always say this, your culture is set by your, by your coaching staff and your players that are returning from, from the year before. Sure. But it's going to change with the 20 new transfers that you have in the door. So if you're trying to stay the same every single year, you're going to be behind. Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. In this episode, I interview Adrian Dinkle, head coach at Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida. Adrian is in his third season as head coach for the Fire, and during Dinkle's first 13 seasons as a collegiate coach, he has helped to build four different programs into national powers. In his first season at Southeastern, Dinkle led the Fire to their first 50-win season, breaking the school record for wins, as well as the program's second Sun Conference tournament title. The Fire also made their third NAIA opening round appearance. In his second season at Southeastern, Dinkle led the Fire to the most historic season to date, winning a program best 59 games and leading SEU to win the 2018 Avista NAIA World Series. And the championship marked the first NAIA national title in Southeastern University athletics history. On the show, Coach Dinkle shares his wealth of experience in developing his team culture of accountability and not being afraid of opening up to players and setting firm expectations. Adrian also explains how he keeps his training competitive, builds up his players' level of responsibility, and establishes respect for hard work. You're going to love this episode, and here is Adrian Dinkle. Coach Dinkle, welcome to the show. I appreciate you guys having me. Oh, definitely. And so I'm really excited to dig into the conversation. And I know you and I have been chatting back and forth for a couple of weeks, trying to set you know our busy schedules in the spring. And and I'm finally I'm, we got you on the mic, and I'm so excited to get started. But for our listeners who want to get to know you a little bit better, uh, give us a short snapshot of why you decided to get into coaching. Honestly, man, because I don't know if I was good at anything else. Uh, you know, I love baseball, love being around baseball, and always had the uh, always had the ability to relay knowledge. And figured this would be the best platform for me, and you know, spread my faith as well along the way. No, I love that, and uh, I just noticed on your Twitter handle that. You're a man of God, and I actually have the exact same thing on there, and and I love to hear that, spreading God's kingdom in any way that we can. But if we're talking about baseball, let's go ahead and, you know, you guys have been extremely successful in your tenure, and and I want to know how you're developing players. So if you could take us through, you know, where you guys started in the fall, and we'll, you know, work up to where we are currently, but let's start in the fall. You know, what does the off season look like? And, and take us through a, a typical week from, you know, this past fall. You know, we predicate our program, you know, just like a lot of others, on being extremely competitive. You know, we, we you know, a lot of college programs will run six days a week. We actually run five days a week because the type of practices we run, we, the way we run our practice is extremely high pace. I mean, we're trying to be the fastest moving team. And when I say high pace, man, I'm not trying to say, you know, done in an hour and a half. I'm just saying we are, we're running through our individuals so quick, getting so many reps on to the next one with break, setting up the field in three minutes, trying to move. And so, we, we take our guys pace, pace, pace. We're trying to make our practices a little bit, you know, more competitive than the games and competitive with one another. So we have a fast paced practice. So we actually put it at five day practices and we set up with our guys and Hey, if you're doing it right, we're getting it right. You're going to have that Saturday off. We never practice Sundays, but you'll have that Saturday off. But if we're not doing the right things, whatever on that Monday, then we will go to that Saturday. But traditionally for us, it's a, it's a five day week and it's fast paced, getting a lot of reps and a lot of important West. We don't want to waste our time, man. I've been, been around long enough that doesn't do us any good just to sit out there and take pointless ground balls. We're going to take our ground balls with, you know, with purpose, our swings with purpose and run our plays with purpose. I really like that. And, you know, something that I, you, we don't get to, you know, peek into other people's practices very often. And the, I'm always trying to find ways to do things a little bit 
better and a little bit faster and to try and save time where I can. So you talk about having faster paced practices and that's probably less time in between things, but how have you found uh, some different ways to do things more efficient or to do things faster that it may be earlier in your career or you see other pro- programs taking a long time to do this or that, or, you know, what are some ways to still do things really well, but to do it at a faster pace? You know, for us, you know, starts with the way we run our individuals. Now I'm pretty blessed here to where I have enough coaches where I'm, I, and you can do this without it as well. I've had it where I've had programs where I've only had a few coaches, but you know, we just when we run our individuals, if we run at 15 minute time sessions, we're getting all those reps from your double play turns to your flip, to your, to your hip pivots and your reads, which so many different fungos going on where I have a guy with our first and third base since I'm with the middle, we have an outfield guy. So they're all getting their defensive reps in 15 minutes, um, a ton of it. Well, then that may roll into a team defense for us, which we call a 21 out. So this is the question we get a lot of the way we run our 21 out. Instead of sticking guys out there with a fungo, and we actually stick guys up in a situation to have two different teams and a fungo at the plate. And that's actually how we run our team defense. So guys are flying all over the place with, you know, helmets on and they're reading cuts. But we're moving, 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 moving. It's competitive and it's actually game-like. And those are things for us instead of just sitting out there and screaming out situations where now we're sitting there talking the entire time. We're putting them in live situations and, you know, more randomized training than block training. And so we actually do that a ton. Um, We'll stop it and break it down, but we're trying to have a bunch of different sections going and moving all working together at one time with a lot of fungo and a a lot of substance going on at one time. But I also have five coaches to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. And it's always good to have good help. And so do you, do you rely on your older guys to kind of get your younger guys who haven't been through the program to understand what to do? Because I'm thinking about this in my head of all the different things that you can do with that. And, and the, you know, you want to go at a fast pace, but I found myself trying to throw a lot at, at the kids at first. And if, if it's something that's new and then we haven't gone over it very well, then it doesn't turn out the way I want it to. So how do you make sure that they get it? They know exactly what they're doing. So you guys can go a whole lot faster than you did, you know, on day one. Our first two weeks of practice every year is actually walkthroughs. Okay. We take our time, whether it's in a classroom, we walk them through, we show them where they need to go. And obviously you are relying on the returners that are back, but at the same time, we have a general rule of thumb in my coaching staff that assume they know nothing. We assume that everybody knows nothing every single day. And so we're constantly on them and sooner or later it becomes a routine and they start to hold each other accountable for it and they turn it into a game and there's competition. But yeah, I mean, we do walk through it. We explain to them where they're going and how they're doing it before because nothing, I don't want to start team practice and nobody has any idea where they're going, mm-hmm. right? We have a practice plan that we set out the day before. Sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's daily. Um, we expect them to learn it. If they don't know it, when they show up to practice and we ask, there's a punishment for it. So they, they have to know the practice plan by the time it hits three o'clock. So do you send that out in a group text or post it somewhere? We will send it out in a group meet. We also post it on there. Most of the time, I'm still old school. I put it up put it in our file with their email it out, send it or I post it right on my door and I make them all come check it daily. Now they're, they get lazy and they'll have one dude take a picture of it and they'll try to send it in their own personal group need. But we tell them, Hey, every day you guys need to come check the board yourself. Uh, what, 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 what you've got going on and they read it. And we try to get it out the day before if possible, the night before. Uh, obviously there's sometimes we sit down after practice and we're making changes to what we originally planned that day because it didn't work the day before. But, we like to actually have it posted the night before so they have the night to you know digest it and, and move on to their, their day. That's really good. And <laughs> I was talking to the players today about you know what I, I would love, I, I kind of love to see what goes on in the players only group me, but I would probably be a little bit embarrassed. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. But so you've got a limited time with them this fall and you guys are under some different time restrictions than you know, uh, unlimited. And so what are you guys trying to make sure that they get in the time that you've got them all together? So what are some different things that you guys are doing while everybody is there? Is it just the, just the team defense aspect? No, no, there's, there's, I mean, there's a plenty of different stuff. I mean, it, we split it up, but I mean, it's, we're competitive. I mean, mm-hmm. super competitive. So everything that we do from our throwing to our, to our catch play to whatever we want to do, it's, it's point driven. First okay. of all, everything we do is point driven. We have charts for everything. Okay. Even to I say our 21 outs, that's actually charted. Um, you're charted. We have a winner or loser. Our inner squads are the same thing. Anything we do is charted as well. So we don't, we never flip the scoreboard on and have a six to four inner squad game or points that way. It's all 
positive and negative. We try to stay more in the positive points and the negative points, but that's all charted out. So we're trying to go everything from the team aspect, obviously, even through our offensive side. Pitchers are out doing their thing, but everybody's still tied together, whether it's through our PFPs, our team defense, or whatever we're doing. Um, they all have their separate times as well through their indies, but we're trying to become the best well oiled machine we can be. And obviously, it's hard to do at times, but we're trying to do the best we can in that three hour time span. Well, that's really good. And, and I love integrating any sort of competition in practice. And I feel like, you know, if you turn on the scoreboard or like you mentioned, you chart just about everything, then it at least heightens awareness. And the kids love to compete and we just need to do it more often. So what are some, you know, besides the charts of 21 outs and some different things, what are some other ways that you guys compete in practices? We have stopwatches on everything. So even through, through, you know, team defensive or, or your thing, it's stopwatch driven. I mean, so it's like, if you get to the convention this year, you know, my boy, pretty good friends with Jake McKinley on that situation. And I tell him all the time, he stole it from me and we just crack up, but we actually run everything. We have four seconds to get the ball and we kind of run in that four. We tell our guys four seconds, but we really play on that four point two. We have that a lot. So those guys are reading it, they're seeing it and it's, there's clocks out there as well. So we actually integrate that a lot. Um, through pretty much everything that we do, getting on and off the field. We have 15 seconds to get on and off the field. Um, So we're saying getting on and off, everything is competition driven. They get points for it all day long, whether they're the red team that day or that black team that day. It is just, it's just point driven across the board because we want high intensity practice. Are there times that we slow it down and and we teach a little bit more or there's some injuries that we got to slow it down during the season? Sure. Um, But during the fall, it's just, it's a lot, it's just high pace the, the entire time. Perfect. And and anything, again, you can turn anything into a competition. So if everything is a competition, I I even, I love that even more. So, okay. So another question that I really like to ask, especially with head coaches, because you are, you're the vision of the program or you have a vision and what you want to accomplish. So what are some different things that you guys do for culture building or what are the different standards that you have for each individual team and different things that you want each team to pass down. So no matter which class just graduated or which incoming freshman class that you have, just say, these are our core things. These are our pillars that we're going to build our entire program on. You know, I think we can, you know, I get that question a lot. I think from everybody, mm-hmm. I think everybody always talks about, you know, what, what are you trying to culture building? And I wish that everybody had the exact answer to that because every group's different. Every group I have different and how our culture is being set. Our, the number one thing we tell our guy, we're a confident and classy group. We're not, you know, we're not, confident and class lit um you know we want guys that are selfless baseball players but that changes every single year with how we're doing things right we get a ton of transfers from division ones from junior colleges to whatever it is and so we get a lot of guys with different motives and things that we're trying to do is we're trying to just teach them to be competitive and support one another through selfless acts you know whether it's picking up trash or whatever we do but i think like that question there is like you know, are we doing races and sack races? No. Are we going to the beach together? And, you know, we'll, we do stuff. We do stuff in the community together, but every group changes and every group is different on how we're trying to build our culture and what we're doing. I think that our culture all the time is we're going to play hard and we're going to do it right. But every group and how we build it is completely different. And we have to find ways to grow. And hey, I may be calling you saying, hey, what did you try that was different this year? Because it's just how it works with each group. Sure. And, you know, I like that answer because you can definitely tell that you've spent some time thinking about that too. And, and, you know, there are some things that always stay the same, but for the most part, the only thing that ever changes is change itself. And I really like that. And, and that's, that's a, that's something that you don't hear a lot, but that's something that is definitely eye opening and something that I just learned from you today. So I appreciate that. And that's, that's really good. I think culture is one of those things that people always say this, your culture is set by your, by your coaching staff and your players that are returning from, from the year before. Sure. But it's going to change with the 20 new transfers that you have in the door. So if you're trying to stay the same every single year, you're going to be behind. So we try to grow in different ways every single year. No doubt. No doubt. And you can definitely tell that you have a a tremendous passion for your players. And so how are you developing them personally and how, you know, what are some different ways that, that you, you know, you just get to know them a little bit better. Well, it's an open door policy at our place, mm-hmm. um, flat out. It's just an open door policy. I and mean, I start every meeting off with the beginning of the year telling them about me personally, you yeah. know, how I grew up, what I did. And I think that before you get to know anybody, you actually got to know them personally. In the first meeting that we have, I explained to them my life on how I grew up, how I had a, a mother with six kids and dad was in and out of prison and things like that. And guys start to open up. And we and I, I make it an effort every single day to go 
talk to somebody or every guy on the team every single day. And we bring them in and discuss them, whether it's through a Bible study or, or just sit in our office and it's an open door policy. And we're pretty in our standard here is we tell our guys that we're pretty black and white. Mm-hmm. I mean, I tell you exactly what's on my mind and I want you to tell me the same thing. I think that there's a lot of places that I've, I've been, I just never knew where I stood as a player. We tell them exactly where they stand, whether we shove a depth chart on there. And those are the things we want to do because, and the problems that we're having, because if we're not correcting those problems, we're condoning any problems they have. So we're, we're extremely black and white. No, that's really, really good. And I, I like that, that, you know, what you allow you, you condone or, or you, or you think is right. And, you know, it's just, it's an everyday battle. I feel like. For sure. No, no doubt, man. You got to grow. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So you mentioned that you also have several different coaches. I think you said five, uh, five assistants or is that five total? Five total. We got, uh, I got two, uh, two full-time assistants and actually two grad assistants that they all, you know, all of them do a tremendous job. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. And so how are you developing them personally? And, you know, this is, this is something that I always have a question about because, you know, I've never been a head coach. I've never been in charge of a program, but I can envision a, a program that, you know, feeds off the head coach and he's helping the, his, his assistants grow and to become head coaches someday. So is, is there a, an intentional way that you go about doing that, that thing? Well, yeah, for sure. And that's something I had to grow in over these last, you know, three years, you know, it was, I actually give a lot of responsibility to my, to my coaching staff. And I'm, if you're my pitching guy, you know, I, ha- I have a plan that's set and here's what it is, but I'm allowing you to go down there and make your own decisions. And I tell them the same thing that when those decisions, you also have, you're treating this program like your head coach, but you need to discipline those guys the same way. And the same thing for our hitting guy. And I put those guys in the fire. I let them run with what they got to do. I'm not watching over their shoulders. And I, I've been in programs where everything we did was questions. You know, do I correct what they're doing behind closed doors? Do I say, Hey, this is what's expected. Absolutely. But I'm also letting them go fail and make mistakes. And a lot of the times, you know, they make me look better than I actually am. So I'm very blessed with those guys, but we sit down and say, Hey, this is the way you need to look at it. This is how you should do it. But you need to figure out a way to put it in your own words. I don't, I don't want robots. I mean, the guys that we hired here, none of them are yes men. I hire that way on purpose. Uh, I want guys that are aren't afraid to challenge me because at the end of the day, my job is to move every single one of them to be become a head coach. So you brought up a great point, and that's that you you try and hire well. So what are some different you know interview questions, or what are you looking for whenever you are having to go through the interview process and hiring some new people? Number one is I want people that want to work, um, that aren't afraid of work. I don't want a guy that wants to be in the office at nine and be out by five. I'm looking for those guys that are that are not afraid to you know sleep on the floor, sleep in their car on the recruiting trail, and aren't afraid to just talk to anybody. And so those are the, honestly the number one things. I'm looking for people that can recruit, mm-hmm. but people that when we notice when they're on the road, will just talk to anybody. I, I, I almost want that annoying guy that's always asking questions because I know that guy is not afraid to work and. So during that thing, I'm asking that question, are you okay with being on the road for two straight weeks? Are you okay with just going and talking to anybody or calling anybody at any given point? So it isn't for me, it isn't the point of how good can you teach the X's and O's. I want guys that can relay, you know, a message or relate with kids and, and be able to pick up a phone and actually have a work ethic. So you're looking for guys with work, et- work ethic and good communicators. 100%. You can't communicate, then you're going to struggle with me. Yeah. I, I, well, and you're going to struggle with kids too, because, you know, if we can't, we can know as much as we want to, this is, you know, you, you've got me going on a, on one of my soapboxes, but I think that communication is a huge piece to being a good coach because we can know whatever we want to, but in the end, if the player doesn't get it, that's our fault. You know, at least I take, right. I take the brunt of it. So maybe I didn't communicate it clearly enough. Maybe I didn't communicate it in a way which they understand. And then maybe the other, you know, 30% is just because they didn't, do it right or they didn't do it correctly the first time and so but i, I always think that if, if there's a you know a, a way to explain things clearer or a way to explain things in a more simple way uh that helps the player understand i'm i'm always looking for that to say less than yeah. i need to or to say the exact amount and not to have to say more because i used to be one of the one of the guys that would have you know 10 or 15 minute post game talks about this or that and now I'm trying to cut it down to okay give me 3 minutes give me 5 minutes at at the max and just trying to mo- be more clear and concise with my communication right and those guys I mean like I said with my assistant number I mean, you got to be if you're not loyal it ain't going to work you know sure. you better be, you better be loyal I mean you have to be loyal I think that's in any coaching staff that I I I'm, my my staff is very loyal to me um they're open to hey 
I'm applying for this job and I'll tell, Hey, I'm trying to get you this job. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, loyalty is the first thing you look at, you know, obviously at the end of the day, I think that we, we can all sit here and say something different. We're looking for guys that are flat out winners. If they've been somewhere else and they've won and they've turned in two places and they've won and they can be loyal along the way, those are the guys we want. Um, you know, we want guys that are, when I say winners, I'm not talking about just W's and L's winners at life, whether it's in their fate, they were winners in the classroom, they're winners in the community, they're servant leaders, they're winners. And that's what we preach to our guys all the time is we want you to be winners at, at, at everything we do in every phase of our day. And that's I'm looking for my staff that have those guys as well. So it rubs off on our players. Oh, that's really, really good. And so you I, I, basically I'm getting, I'm getting an outline and a couple of things that really stand out that you guys are very competitive that you are taking advantage of, of and maximizing the amount of time that you guys have. But let's say that you're going over, you know, your team rules. So what are some things that you're like, guys, I, I want you to do you, which you give it. It sounds like you give a ton of freedom within the different parameters that you have, but these are the things that you have to do to do well in this program. So like our rules at union are be on time and do things right. So if we're on time, we we're there for the first part, you know, and we're, if we're on time, then we're early and then we do things right. It's kind of a gray area thing, but it makes you think, am I doing this or that right? So I'd love to hear, you know, what your rules or standards are. I mean, it's, I mean, I think there, as you're saying, we don't have, when I say we don't have a lot of, we do. I mean, we have the same thing as you, you better be on time. Don't be late, but we're expecting you to be servant leaders and, and be winners at every phase. And then just like I said, we have rules that you don't wear our hat backwards and you can't wear earrings or no cutoff sleeve. Your shirts must be tucked in. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the things. And for us, those are strikes one, two, whether it's classroom, you're gone, you know, obviously no drugs and things like that. We're pretty clear cut that these are our rules. These are black and white. You stay with them if you don't get out of our program. Right. Um, and it's just an expectation to be great every day. And that, at the end of the day, that whatever that umbrella falls, that umbrella, your expectation to be great. We don't want mediocrity in our program. Do we have guys that try to walk that fine line 100%? But we're, we're going to fix that along the way. And if I have to fix it more than once, then we're going to talk about, hey, maybe this isn't the right program for you. So I think that the general rules there are, you know, flat out there you're going to show up and give us effort and you're going to give us energy and you're going to expect to be great every single day at everything you do. If you fall outside those guidelines, then we just don't need you in our program. Let me take a few seconds to tell you guys about OnBaseU. OnBase University is an organization that studies how the human body moves in baseball and softball. They offer certification seminars that teach coaches, trainers, and medical professionals how to assess an athlete's physical ability to perform movement patterns that are specific to hitting and pitching. For example, they just put up a blog on their website, onbaseu.com, that discussed why hip internal rotation is important in hitting and how they evaluate it with their OnBaseU screen. If you want to learn more about OnBaseU, I did a podcast with OnBaseU founder, Dr. Greg Rose, episode 78, who talked about this and modeled the screen after golf assessments that he created for TPI. They are hosting pitching and hitting seminars in Newark, Houston, and Chicago over the next few months. And I will be attending the one in Houston, and I hope to see you there. Sure. I like that. I like that a lot. There has to be an expectation to be great every day. I may just tweet that out later tonight because that's, that's absolutely <laughs> awesome. So we're, we're talking about, you know, you guys win and you are, have won, you know, ever since you've got there and you're continuing to get better and be competitive and you've, you've outlined some different things in practice. But when we're talking about developing players, we talked about developing them off of the field, but how are you really prioritizing individual development within the player itself? So you said that the team changes every year and you, we've talked about the team setting quite a bit, but. Talk to us about how you're sitting down and you're breaking down some different things to do with each player and how they can improve themselves to ultimately improve the team. Yeah, everybody's different. I mean, we tell everybody when they walk in the door here, you know, when you get to college baseball, there's three things. You got your social, you got your academic, and you got your athletic. One of those have to disappear. Which one do you think it's going to be? It's going to be the social life. And then we find each individual person, whether they struggle academically, and we explain to them the importance of, of getting a degree because I'm a huge believer that it's a direct correlation between what you do in the classroom and how you do on the field. It's going to catch up. If you're a guy that loves to play in the gray area, sooner or later it's going to catch up with you on the athletic side. If you're a dude that wants to sneak out and try to be an idiot and party all the time, it's going to catch up. So we find each individual and we actually explain your know, life growth. Or, hey, we have guys right now that, you know, you'll call 
and you'll realize they're waking up at 11 in the morning and I'll pick up the phone now and call those guys at 8 30 say get up out the bed and make your bed and start your day off in a good foot we do and just it's time to get out of bed man it's time to start being an adult and every guy is different whether it's how they speak to people, what, how, what kind of servant leader they are. Are they doing more in the community? How are they treating people? They learn how to talk. And we actually find difference for every single person. Do they know how to speak uh, to mm-hmm. talk to people? Do they know how to act? Are they early? Are they always the guy that, you know, practice starts at three o'clock? Are they rolling in at two fifty eight? And so every person is different on our team. I think that everybody says they have a general guideline of, yeah, we all do, but we're trying to find what's, each individual weakness each player has. And we're just trying to fix that as we go throughout the year. And if we can grow on one phase, that's great. If that guy can get it early, we'll move to phase two on that guy. But it's, it's a general growing all the time in our program year by year, each player. Sure. Sure. So is there a, an opportunity for you to use the players to help get the other players in line? Because I'm always intrigued by, you know, we, we, our best teams, essentially they regulate themselves, right. And they kangaroo court sure. and they take care of, of what we don't like taking care of, which is the discipline stuff. But are there conversations that you have with your players about that stuff? I mean, essentially, you know, I wanting to be a head coach someday and wanting to cultivate a culture like that. And and it sounds like you've got that. How did you go about that aspect of it? Um, No, one thing we do that is kind of helped us is we actually split our teams up in groups, uh, whether it's groups of five and they're all on a team and they're actually put on there and they're, they're scored all year long, whether on their, on their grades, their practice, their effort and practice, their, you know, their, their involvement in the community, all that kind of stuff, their grades on tests, they get points on it. So you actually start to see that those guys there, if there's five on a group, they start to push one another because they get a reward at the end of the year. Cause every kid wants a reward. Right. And for us, it's, you know, you'll get, you know, a jacket, shorts, t-shirt, you know, you'll get a bunch of that stuff in the package. And so that stuff, they actually start holding each other accountable because their team wants to win because everybody wants to be a winner. And so we actually split them up in groups and that's the best way. Cause I've always thought that if you just try to have two guys, we don't name captains. I refuse to name captains. I just don't think that I don't, for me, that's not never worked. So we actually just stick guys on groups and they hold each other accountable on that aspect. And that starts to feed over to them all day in practice. And say, My shortstop got, you know, one of our left-handed arms on his team and he's slacking that day. He's kind of actually getting on him like, Hey man, you're going to drop points for us today. Pick it up. Let's go. Or, Hey, you missed class today. Get your butt to class. So you can stop losing points for us. And they're holding each other accountable that way to start doing it right. Because they all want reward. And then they start to realize, Hey, that's just the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. I, re- I really like that a lot. And, and that's something that, you know, we do here too. And, I think that, again, if you can get, if your best players and are your best leaders and they're taking care of the stuff that we don't have to, I really think you've got a chance to be pretty good. And so we're in the middle of spring right now, or I guess in the, at the end, ending part of spring, but what is a, t- can you take us through what a typical practice pre- plan would look like? You know, you're midweek and uh, you, you obviously love the fast paced aspect of it. So take us through what, you know, a practice plan would look like for you guys on just say like a random Wednesday. During the spring or mm-hmm. in the fall? Yeah, in the, in the spring. Two different things. Sure. In the spring, we're, we're a little bit more light because we'll have those, you know, we'll have a Tuesday, you know, midweek game. So the Wednesday, we're going to get out there. We're going to have a long stretch. And sometimes it's a long tough day. Sometimes it's a light throw day, depending on where we feel like the arms are at that day. We're going to jump into our individuals because we still want to focus on the details of how we're rolling a double play, our communication. Um, then we're, traditionally going to jump into one fast pace 10 minute thing everybody's going to get it we're going to talk about it and then we're going to talk about cfp if our bug coverage is our first and thirds or anything we're doing we jump into bp we just generally in the spring this late we're trying to keep it as light as possible we have a 55 game regular season uh, we're trying to make sure guys are just staying fine-tuned we're not trying to you know wear them out at this point so the spring is completely different than the fall so they go fast pace today we had practice for an hour and 45 minutes um, and we got a lot of stuff man I mean, and I think a lot of people go, we got to practice more. No, we're going to practice less time. We're just going to get way more reps. And then we're going to jump into our BPs. And our BPs are different than a lot of people's BPs. So that's a lot of stuff we do. In the fall, it's a little bit more stretched out. In the spring, it is less keep it moving, keep bodies moving, take care of bodies, understand where we need to be on these plays, understand where we need to be in our communication. And that's the stuff. And it's quick and it's boom. And they want to be off the field because I think a lot of people realize the players don't really want to be out there on a wet day past mm. two hours. Then you start to lose attention. They don't, they don't. And I think people, and for the coaching, most of the time, those players got a lot going on in their day. And 
I found better results in the last five, six years of, hey, stop extending the practice, get what we need to get in, communicate, talk, boom, get out. If the guy needs individual work, we save that extra hour to take them in the cage and work it. If a pitcher needs extra work, we take that time to work it from there. No, I really like that. And the BP setup caught my attention. So do you mind working us through what you guys do for BP? We're all different. Uh, we have a ton of different, and, and we don't have our BPs just tailored to a team. Uh, today we did. Um, it was just team overall because of the way our swings were this last week. But we actually try to set up our BP, you know, tailored to each individual, whether it's we don't, we're never, ever, and we never have, and we never will. We're not going to stand out there and have four rounds of five hit it where you are. It's not going to be happening. We're restraints driven. There's a lot of restraints in our BPs, whether it's three angle BP, two angle BP, what we call no pop, no pull, uh, through our approach or our zone BPs. They're all different and they're all set up differently. And there may be a day in there where group one's group needs to be what we call approach BP, which is we're more narrowing our focus and shrinking our zone because we had the tendency that weekend to swing outside of ourselves and, and chase bad pitches. And our quality of bats were bad with those four to five guys. But then another group, needed to be more the barrels were getting long they may run into what we call a zone bp there where there's a t outside on the outside which we actually rig it up and put a pool noodle on there another t behind you we're keeping you more you know directional and we're keeping the barrel short and turning the barrel instead of you know tilting the barrel which is the new twitter thing right um we don't we don't teach that we do that there and there's days in there where it may be all angle bp for everybody but you, you are never going to stand in front of you and just say hit it where you want this is, that's not happening. You want to swing free on your own. That's for you to do in the cages. Other than that, everything has a purpose and a rhyme or reason for why we, and the styles we hit BP. We try to tailor each individual. Is that every day? No. I mean, today it was all no pop, no pull for the entire team. Uh, when I say that, it sounds like we're just flipping the ball. Now it's all progression based through four different rounds. Those guys are still looking to hit a ball. And there's times in there where we have no pop, no pull. We put targets out there and you get, you know, one point, if you drive it here, two points, you drive it there. But um, we try to find out for the guys that are struggling, the guys that are swinging well, hey, they're going to get the drill, keep the confidence for the guys that are struggling. We're trying to build on those guys, not for the guys that are swinging well. I understand. And I really like that, you know, the the further that, is, that the season goes on, the you're t- trying to take a little bit of time off here and there. And I think that will help you peak at the right time. At least that's the idea. And so for those listening who are, you know, getting ready for the postseason or are getting to that point in their season or really have questions about how to peak at the right time. Do you have any advice for those guys? Yeah, don't tack. I mean, I think uh, don't tack bodies. I think that we get a lot of guys. And I, the biggest thing for us, and I, I think it helps us moving forward, we limit a lot of the acts on the arm early. I um, mean, we just yeah. do. We run progression based and we just limit them. And you'll see our guys throw more than you know, 65 to 75. I'm not a huge pitch count guy, but when I would say more in innings, you're not going to get out there and throw more than five innings. It's progression based. And we work from there. We also, you know, make sure that we're communicating with them daily on how do you feel? How does the body feel? How much work can we get in? Because we're trying to have, you know, max intent on game day and not so much on practice days during the spring. I think a lot of people got to practice hard. No, the bottom line is I need to get you out there in the right shape and the right form to be max intent that day. Are you guys still hitting the weight room pretty hard? We're still hitting the weight room. We've slowed it down a little bit. We hit it uh, two to three times a week, more two times a week right now. We've actually, with our tournaments that we've had lately going to the national tournament here next week, it's more body weight stuff. Uh, we still do it. We have, we tried to keep them in shape, but with finals and everything, to be honest right now, it gets a little bit rough. We still are in the weight room and still doing those things. Perfect. Perfect. So let's say that, uh, you know, the inevitable happens, which the season comes to an end. And, you know, I'm always curious because we all have postseason meetings and we talk to our players about some different things that they need to improve on for the next year or, you know, what your expectations are. Do you mind just taking us inside of what a, you know, a postseason meeting would look like for a guy that you know is coming back that you're just talking through, you know, with him of different improvements and different things? So what would what would that look like for you guys? It's honest. Okay. I mean, it's just honest. We, you know, I've been in those meetings where it's like, oh man, you had a great year. We expect this, but it's just bottom line is, Hey man, you need to get better at this. And if this is what you do get better at, then this is where you're going to be next year. Um, then we tell every single one of our guys that's in that room. Hey, nothing. You may have started for us and played all 55 games in the regular season. You're not our guaranteed starter next year. Um, but we're direct 
and straightforward with what we expect them to do in the fall. I don't sugarcoat it. And the guys that aren't playing, that are struggling, that didn't everything, and we may look at them and say, you want to transfer? Here's your open release. We're, we're pretty, pretty direct and pretty honest for those meetings. I think that a lot of times you're sitting there and they're long, drawn-out conversations. I pretty much tell them, here's your opportunity to say anything that you want to say. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Say it. And then but I tell them, if you're going to ask or you're going to tell me something, to expect a blunt answer back. And that's how all of our meetings are. It is pretty direct and exactly what we talked about all year. We're like that all year, so I don't think our guys ever wonder where they stand. Mm-hmm. They want to know why they're not playing. We tell them why they're not playing. They want to know, how do I get better? Hey, you need to go put on 20 pounds. Mm-hmm. You need to do this, or you need to put on 15 pounds, or hey, you need to get better at driving a baseball to this side of the field. And it's, it's basically direct and open and saying, this is what we expect from you moving forward. Or a lot of the times, honestly, our conversation is where they need to be at in their life and the next steps they need to take in their life to be successful once this game's over with. I really like, like that a lot. And so is that something that, you know, just going back just a little bit, but during the season, you have a guy that you can tell is frustrated or a guy that hasn't been playing or a guy that's playing every day. Are those conversations that you have with them throughout the week of, hey, I know you're playing every day, but this guy's pushing you, or I know you're not playing every day, but you keep working and, and doing these different things because, you know, I feel like I need to get better at that. I feel like a lot of our coaches, we get so set on winning and losing and how do we improve as a team that we sometimes forget about talking to each individual and seeing where their mindset is. Uh, any advice for that? Uh, once again, I'm going to go back to just being honest. We do it during our indies. When I'm out with our middle infield, there's a guy struggling a little bit. I'll just be honest. They had him. Better pick it up or Carlos is going to take your spot. Mm-hmm. And it's going to happen soon. And Carlos, you keep working, you're going to grab that spot. And they're like, he ain't joking. And mm-hmm. it's just, we just grab them. I'll call them. I'll send them a text if the guy is really struggling. I do that quite a bit. I'll write them a note, you know, how much they mean, how important they are to the team. Don't hang your head. And I don't, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, we're going to bring it up in a group and do it. No, I'm, I'll send them a note at night how important you are. And I'll do that quite a bit. I'll send a guy a text a lot. Hey, man, love everything you're doing for us right now. Stay hot. If things start going cold, keep your head up. Let's keep rolling. But, you know, I traditionally send a lot of messages out to them to just let them know where we stand for every single guy. I mean, we try to stay on every single guy. Obviously, the guys that are playing really, really well, they're happy all the time, right? But mm-hmm. I just bring them back down to earth. Hey, big boy, you ain't going to keep hitting 400. Better keep working or this is coming <laughs> for you. That's awesome. And, you know, you, you mentioned text and I, you know, I, I how long does that take? It, it doesn't take very long to just send a text if, if you're thinking it. Uh, you may as well just send it out. And I like that a lot. That's a really good idea. And it's something that's simple. Right. And we do it. I'll put it in. The, well, I'll do times. I'll throw my notes. If I was thinking about it, I'm sitting around the office. I'll chuck it in my notes. I'll start putting it together. And that night, I'll copy and paste it and shove it a text to the kid. Well, that's great. So I, I've got some lightning style questions for you. And so they're essentially, you know, you're, just your advice on a couple of different things. And the first one I always start off with is because I really like to to reflect on the season and and eventually your career, but what advice would you have for first year head coaches? Or if you could go back and tell yourself something before you started and before your first year, what would it be? Number one thing would be obviously, you know, would be don't be afraid of discipline. Don't be afraid to hurt someone's feelings. I think that we're, we're in a generation now where we're afraid to say something or do something to a kid because they may email, you know, your athletic director or they just may backtalk you don't be afraid to discipline because these kids are looking for it. They may write the email, but that's what they're looking for. Don't be afraid. And for young assistants, tell every one of my guys, don't be afraid of free. And when I say, don't be afraid of free, don't be afraid to go somewhere that work for free. Don't be afraid to grind. Don't be afraid of hard work. Uh, those are the, those are big things for me. And as I tell my staff, whenever they have a chance to go on is don't let the W's and L's define who you are. I was that way early. I thought that everybody would like me if I won. Uh, at the end of the day, dude, no one cares. Um, if you win or lose and don't let that be you because it doesn't matter you're a head coach don't panic in your first year if you aren't winning tell every one of them don't panic Mm -hmm. set your culture set your program set your expectations and don't worry about the wins loss record do we want to compete and win yeah we all do man we're all competitive individuals but that's not going to be a direct correlation of exactly who you are as a human being so and number one thing i tell everybody is be different don't pull up twitter and copy what everybody else is doing or whatever (laughs) else you do be your own man be completely different. I, I pride ourselves in our program and what we do here on being completely different than everybody else. I don't want to be what anybody else is doing. If they're doing something, I'm like, I'm going to find a different way to do it that fits our program. I don't want to do what anybody else is doing. I like that a lot. And that's something that, 
you know, we always fall in the, into the trap of we see something else that looks cool and we want to try it. And, and I think, you know, looking for the next best thing. And, you know, I, I, being on a podcast, I find myself doing that all the time of trying to, I get just so much good information from a lot of different coaches and trying to figure out how to make that mine or simplify some different things that instead of, you know, trying everything, just making sure that we maximize what we're trying to do. And I, I really like that. And, you know, on that same subject, what's something that you've learned lately that's gotten you really excited? You know, something I want to get into a little bit more and it's, is modus. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. You know, the arm pair stuff, they kind of mm -hmm. hook yeah. up to your arm through practice is modus. And that's something I've gotten a little bit more and that has a lot to do with, you know, two of my pretty good friends, uh, you know, Brian Conger that's now with the Rangers and uh, Ben Buck's actually my best friend. He's the head coach at Lamar Community College. He's into nice. it now. And so that's kind of stuff that, you know, I'm real into as far as trying to get, am I where they are? No, you know, as are Kong's the best in the business at it. But, you know, just picking at it, finding, hey, how can we maximize everything we're doing from our throwing? Is this guy a long toss day three times a week or is he two times a week? And that basically, honestly, the system basically tells you who's ready and who's not. So that's something new for me that, you know, I'm starting to dig into a little bit more. You know, I drive, Buck drives me nuts about it and I drive him nuts about it. But that's something that I'm kind of excited, hopefully, that we can find the funds to actually get that, you know, in our program. I really like that. That's that's awesome. And no two better guys out there than Ben and Brian and, and two guys that, that have influenced my coaching career as well. So I love love the shout outs that you're giving with with Jake McKinley as well, because again, those those are three awesome, awesome guys and awesome guys to learn from. So uh, with within your team setting, something that I think we all would like more of is money to buy cool stuff like that. So is there any way that you've gotten creative with the different resources that you have and just essentially most of our coaches don't work in pro ball that are listening to the show. So what are some, some ways that you've well, gotten creative with uh, some of the different things that you guys have? Oh, I mean, a ton of different ways, man. Obviously you want to be point driven, come up with your point chart, mm -hmm. uh, keep that creative because kids love that stuff. They want to be creative. But another thing is we, we have a little bit of money here now where we'll, we'll hit our mule balls, our weighted balls, but things I've done in the past, man, is we hit flat basketballs, flat mm -hmm. soccer balls. Um, we had a punching bag that we tie up around our cage. Um, Heck, I mean, I didn't have stuff to sit on what we call our zone BP to keep swing sort. I mean, we went and go tackling dummy from our football program and put on the outside part of the plate. Things like that. We're always looking for little details. We have stride box that we straight just make out of wood ourselves and you know, allows us to stay, you know, directional and we make those things. So I honestly try to find anything we're doing, whether it's our points. Heck, I'll go ask the football program, can I use your yardage markers and put those in the outfield? Mm -hmm. You know, so you're driving a point to, hey, to the 20 or to the 30, and that's what we use. But we try to find anything. Now I'm in a situation where I can get a little bit more, but heck, I mean, if you're looking a way to create different things, you can find those things anywhere. The heck, football team's throwing them away. Go get it from them. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So the last one, and it's always a, a really interesting one because we are influenced by so many different people and you know books and resources. So if you were going to just throw out a couple that you really like that our listeners would, you know, you would recommend them to dig into, you know, what would those favorite resources be? You know, all the podcasts are huge. I mean, those are big things. Another book that I really love and a lot of people is The Legacy Builder by Rod Olson. I like that. Um, that's something for me that I've read and it kind of talks about, you know, even collecting coins through recruitings and the mindset of people. And I think the number one resource still to this day is, is pick up the phone and call other coaches. Call them, email them. I still do it. I mean, all the time, whenever we have issues or I can't figure something out. I mean, like I said, I still call Ben all the time and, mm -hmm. and Buck and we'll talk all the time, but I email call the coaches. I, I learned more from instead of listening to a podcast. I may say, Hey, I'm just going to figure out what they do. And I'm going to send a direct email, go to other people's practices. I still do. I mean, I go watch our women's basketball team practice or our football team practice. And I talk to other coaches from other sports. That's kind of my thing is I actually like to watch other coaches from other sports way more than I like to watch on the baseball side. Cause I just like to see how they communicate and how they work and how they do things. And what's something I can steal from them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, I really like that a lot. So Adrian, I, I appreciate your time. And I know that there will be some coaches who are, are loving this and maybe want to reach out to you and, and see, pick your, just pick your mind about one thing or another. So what would be the best way to get in touch with you online in case they want to get in touch? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can catch me on Twitter. You know, it's at, at Adrian Dinkle. It's Twitter handle there. My email is just Adrian, uh, 
It's the A Dinkle, A D I N K E L at S E U dot E D U. That's my email. You got the Twitter handle. Those are the things, best way to reach me. And I'll say this I've done a lot of speaking, you know, at some of the conventions. And I apologize if I don't get back to you right away. And when I spoke to Utah, a lot of those guys, if you're listening, I apologize. You're so caught up. They're looking for a lot of the stuff that we do. I'll try to get back to you the best we can. It's just so many emails and so many days and so many people looking for different things. But you send me an email, I'll do the best I can to get back to you. I love it. Well, I'm just going to open up the mic and and once again, thank you for coming on the show. And, you know, in 43 minutes that we've been recording, it's just been fat, like your practice is fast paced and just full of great information. And, and I know I got better, but is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? I appreciate everything. If I can help you guys in any way, please do. And God bless everybody. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which could include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.